May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. If you would turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 112. Psalm 112. If you were to take Psalm 111 in the original Hebrew and Psalm 112 in the original Hebrew and laid them on top of one another, the line length would be the same. There would be the same number of lines in in. Hebrew poetry with their meter and rhyming, they would be exactly the same. And so many commentators who look at this, believing there are no accidents in Scripture, there's no coincidences with God, believed from the last couple of thousand years that these are to be read uh, together, perhaps one at the beginning of a service, one at the end of the service, Uh, Somehow they are bookends because Psalm 111 talks about God and how godly God is and all the great things he does. And Psalm 112 talks about a godly man and what people, godly people do. It says how to become one and it says the attributes or how you will function in daily life. You will function as a godly person and what does that look like. And so, it starts out by saying, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in His commandments. We have talked before about uh, last psalm, actually, Psalm 111. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you fear the Lord, you believe He exists, you believe there are consequences in how we relate to Him. And those consequences, if I hate God, are bad. And so that would produce fear, and therefore I would try to figure out how to get in God's good graces, how to be on God's side in this life, and that would cause me to get into the Word, to go to church, to be with other Christians, and these are all acts that produce wisdom. And so the fear of the consequences of God in our lives can bring us to the place where we are participating in the grace of God and therefore having a level of wisdom. But the question is, okay, I'm saved, I'm in church, I want to be a godly person, I want to do things for God, I want to, as kids would say today, level up in the Christian life, I want to do more for God. And it says here, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. I've already figured that out. So what does it mean for me today? Today, I do not fear God in the same way as an unsaved person would. God is my heavenly father. God has sent his son to die for me. I see God as steadfast love. I see God as gracious and just. And a fear of that doesn't make Sense And so what does the fear of the unsaved person mature into in the saved person? I think the best way to look at it is if we continue to fear God, we are taking Him seriously. We still understand that there are those who are going to hell and I must witness to them. We also understand that God has certain standards and even though I don't obey God out of fear, I obey Him out of love, there is an understanding that, especially when Jesus Christ comes again, that's going to be a terrible, nasty, really terrible, difficult time where lots of people will be killed, where there will be diseases, where there will be large armies moving across the world. And this is something that I look at and I say, I don't want to be in that. I don't want to participate in the wrath of God on the world. Therefore, I'm going to follow him and bank on a pre-trib rapture. And we'll see what happens when it happens. But bank on him taking care of me even through that. That is our understanding. And so as I walk through the world today, As I put on my mask and go into the grocery store, I am walking and acknowledging acknowledging that I am in the presence of God, that God is there with me, that God is there watching over me, that what is happening is God participating in my life. One thing we have to understand is that there are 
two types of people in the world. There are two uh, relationships you have with God. There are people out there who I could grab somebody off the street and say, uh, what is your relationship with God? And they might say, well, I don't believe in God. Therefore, they would say that they have no relationship with God, that God may be out there, but they don't care. And they translate that into God doesn't care either. Most people who say they do not believe in God or they think God is some creation of their mind um, will put it into a, a, a situation where God believes the same thing about them that they believe about God. Every person on the earth today, about seven and a half billion people, give or take, every single one of them is either right now being blessed by God or being cursed by God. There is no third option. There is no neutrality. You are either being blessed by God or cursed by God. That is the only two things God will do to human beings. Now you go back to Adam and Eve, all the way to the present, people who have counted people and looked at records from China and the Bible and these old records, Hindu records, and, and they put together a number. They say that since the dawn of man, and we would say God is, uh, that God created Adam and Eve, some might say first time a, a monkey walked upright or whatever, however they would say it. The dawn of man back then of Homo sapiens to now, there have been 79 to 80 billion of us. Okay? There's seven and a half billion alive now. And so about that many have come and gone and died. And these are alive now. And it's going to continue until Jesus Christ comes back. And we, I don't know, maybe we'll hit 100 billion. I do not know. Every single one of them, you can look in an old record. You can go to the county clerk's office and, and find your great-great-grandfather's marriage license. And you can point to that and say, at that moment that he got married... He was either being blessed by God or being cursed by God. And depending on how he lived his life and what he believed, now he is being blessed by God or being cursed by God. So all those that have died are either in a blessing position with God or a cursing position with God. No human being has ever existed or ever will exist that is not either being blessed by God or being cursed by God. And so the question we need to ask, we need to understand is, how do I make sure I'm blessed by God? Because if you're looking at God, in pretty much any thought about God, He's big and He can do anything, and if He's mad at you, that's a bad position. And so, however you want to figure it out in your brain, you will come to the question, how do I get blessed by God starting today for the rest of my life and into the afterlife? How do I stay in the blessed program and not the cursed program? That is the question. And this tells you how to do that. This psalm will instruct you how to walk in God's blessings. Now, first of all, we need to understand what does it mean when I say blessing? Cursing, we pretty much know. I can, I can imagine a curse. I can imagine a curse coming through. And you can remember all movies. I remember when uh, the old... Uh, it's a movie with Cher called Moonlighting. Yeah. And uh, Cher's mother looks at a plane and she curses it as it's taking off. And Cher says, well, I don't believe in curses. And the mother says, ah, neither do I. But there's cursing th in, throughout the world. We know how to curse things and wish ill on people and say bad things about people and situations. There is a lot, a lot of cursing going on in the world today of people saying this is bad and that needs to be hurt and they're wishing ill. There's very little blessing in the world. And 
That also brings us to the point that if you're going to look for a source of blessing, don't look for it in the world. They're not very good at it. Uh, they're fickle and they're arbitrary and they're capricious and they may be blessing you today, but they'll be cursing you tomorrow. If God is blessing you, that's going to last. That's going to stay the same forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And so blessing, some people may translate it as happy. A lot of your living Bible sort of documents will say happy is the man who does this. And I think that's true but weak. If you're talking about God's blessing you, what it means at its core is God is favoring you. God has favor upon you. Looking at life, I would much rather be under the favor of God than under the cursing of God. I would much rather, when God looks at me, he thinks favorable things about me. He thinks favorable things about what I'm going to be doing. And he works favor into my life. This is something that we can have. Now, when you become a Christian and accept Jesus Christ, you enter into the favor of God. God will never curse you. But the question is, can I live a deeper Christian life than just saved? There is a sense when Paul is writing that it isn't the best to be saved barely. There are people who are saved who don't really do anything for the kingdom, and we will see them in heaven. And we may be surprised they're there, I don't know. But we will, they, they do not participate. They do not do the best thing for God. And so it is better, and it's better scripturally, and you live a better life, and things happen better if you put God first and you live for God. And that is what this psalm is about. When it talks about living for God, the difference is like the sun and the moon. We live in a world today where people are being told to be the sun, to be their own light, to, to make their own kingdom, to sit on their own throne, to do whatever they want, to build their own life from their own desires. That is, that is the, the theology of the world today. The Christian view and the, the theology of the Bible is that God is the sun, God is the only sun, and we are the moon. The moon has no light. They've been to the moon. It is a dusty rock. There is nothing there. There is nothing produced out of the moon. It is a nothing rock in space. But there are nights where you go out, and the moon up there is as bright as the sun, where you don't even need, you know, you can walk outside without a flashlight at 2 in the morning. There are nights where the, sun, the moon is a very bright entity. Where does it get the light? It gets it from the sun. The sun, which you can't see because it's on the other side of the world over there, the moon is reflecting the sun. We need to be people who reflect God. I don't have my own light. I am really just a nothing rock in the world. God shines through me, shines off of me. I reflect God. I reflect the things of God. I want people to look at me and get some sense about who God is because I am reflecting God. I don't necessarily want people to get excited about my plans or my thoughts or my direction so that I get the glory, because if it's my plans and they succeed, I did good, I get the glory. Of course, that glory is very short-lived in the world. They'll turn on you in 15 minutes. But if God is reflecting on me, and I'm always pointing people and situations and ideas and thoughts to God... And there is this idea that I am supposed to reflect the light of God. Then I am in a situation where good, bad, or indifferent, I'm always in God's will. I'm always in God's light. And I am not responsible then for the outcome. I'm not responsible for what people think. I'm not responsible for people liking me. 
I want them to like God. And most people don't, but that's how it is. And so this first verse is called a beatitude, because anytime you start a verse with blessed, that is a theological term, you call it a beatitude. Matthew 5 has the longest list of beatitudes at the start of the Sermon on the Mount. And so blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who takes God seriously, who invites God into everything they do, who has God on their mind, who converses with God in their head as they're doing things. They don't believe that over here God is not there, but over here God is here. They believe that God is everywhere, that God is watching us, not out of judgment, not out of hate, not out of cursing. He's watching us out of love, and He wants to be involved in that. And so, if we are taking God seriously, and it says, who greatly de delights in His commands. Delighting in God's commands takes two steps. One, you got to obey the commands, and then you got to delight in the commands. And there's a step before that, you got to know the commands before you obey the commands, before you delight in the commands. My bachelor's degree was at San Jose State in comparative religious studies. There were Christians in my classes. There were also Buddhists and Hindus and atheists, and some people were there to take the general ed stuff, and all manner of people. And I would, during the breaks in classes, I would talk to people about religion, because that's what we were here to study. And I remember one guy specifically, he said, I only live by the Ten Commandments. And I thought, all right, cool. How are you doing with number 10? Just try to get a conversation going. He said, what do you mean? And so I knew he didn't know the Ten Commandments, but he said he lived by the Ten Commandments. If I am going to put a banner out there saying, I live by the Ten Commandments, I better be able to rattle them off when anybody asks, because it's only 10 things, you should be able to do it. I've known people who say they live by the Sermon on the Mount. And I will say, oh, what, what are three foundational points that Jesus was trying to get at at the Sermon on the Mount? And they get confused. They, they know the Sermon on the Mount exists. They know it's a lot of red letters in your Bible. And so that's a good thing to point to and say, that's what I live by. But you should be able to give a rough outline, a quick outline of the point of the Sermon on the Mount if you say you live by it. There are, in the Old Testament, 613 commands. There are the Ten Commandments and 603 more. People have codified them. There are thousands of books written about the 613. You can go to websites and they'll be listed alphabetically, by length, by what, I mean... Sliced and diced, all 613, your average Jewish person had to know what they were to do the right things and to avoid the bad things. And that was the life that was, when we talk about the law, the Mosaic Covenant, that is the foundation of it. There are 613 rules, about a little less than half are things that you have to avoid or don't do, and the rest are things that you have to do actively. Participating in Passover with the 20-some-odd rules in Passover are part of the 613, for example. That's something that you do. So we say we don't have to do that because we're not Jewish, we're not under that covenant. God, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So, what are those? Well, fortunately, God being gracious, there's only 49 of those in the New Testament. Jesus only commanded 49 things. And I think it's a good idea for Christians to know what they are. You can, I have, for example, a bookmark. It opens up. lists all 49 and the verses that they're in. There are tens of thousands of products because people out there want Christians to be obedient, 
want people to obey the command. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus said that. There are 49. You have to know what they are. You don't have to memorize them, but you have this. It says, honor God in Matthew 5.17. So I can look at my day and I can say, how have I actively honored God today? And I can build that into my day. And if you want more, here's a little book that has 49 commands, same commands. It is generally, there's not a discussion about what Jesus commanded. It is a settled issue. Okay, 49. And you look here and it says, okay, here's deny yourself. It actually has the verse. Then it has other verses that talk about it. Then the other page is personal application. How well do I understand the concept that death is required for life? And that's something I can look up and then I can learn the 49 commands. And I think once you get into that and once you begin to say, okay, this is what Jesus said. It is a real number that I can count. Jesus was not vague. Jesus did not say, ah, do some good stuff. Okay? Not vague. He was very specific, and people have done the hard work for you and listed all these commands, and we can keep those in front of us, and we can pick one and say, what am I going to do today? And I think the more you do that, it will become interesting. It'll become like a botanist looking at a new flower. It'll become a explore finding a new continent. It'll be something that you've never thought about Christ before this way. And I think we can get to the point where we delight in God's commands, where we look at denying myself, picking up my cross, what does that mean? How am I doing that? I can pray and God can show me things and expand my mind. And I can think about this and I think it becomes very interesting. I think it becomes an adventure of Christian life when we begin to look at what Jesus really said he wanted us to do. And if we look at this list, because the whole middle section of two through nine, is you find a person who is doing this, walking down the street, and this is what they look like. A person who is actively favored by God and who knows it will be able to pass this information intergenerationally. In other words, if you see somebody really turned on for God, really following God, really favored by God, the belief in Scripture is that whatever kids they have, and back then when you extended family, you would have uh, grandkids living at home, that all of these would see it and there would be a reflection. So he's reflecting the sun, he's the moon. And the kids, when they're very young, become reflectors of him. And then as time goes by, they become their own moons, as it were, and reflecting God directly. Now, is it a guarantee? No, there are no those sorts of family guarantees in Scripture except for eternity. But the idea is you have a better chance than if you ignore your kids or teach them Satanism or something. You have a better chance of having them follow God if you are following God in everything you do, if you're taking God seriously. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. And once again, generally speaking, people who follow God, people who put God first, who take God seriously, tend to be taken care of. They aren't the richest people in the world, uh, but the psalm says, I've never seen, no, Proverbs, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, I've never seen his seed baking, breaking for bed, begging for bread. However, there are Christians in China who are godly people, who are in prison and begging for bread. It's a general truth, it's a general truism, as persecution grows, uh, there are going to be fewer homeowners who are Christians. There are going to be fewer Christians. If you don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy anything. 
So, you, you know, if your car breaks and you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy a car. So there are changes coming. But where Christianity has taken off in the Middle East, here, Australia, China before the current persecution, the Christians were taken care of. They, were, they had enough money to live. They weren't beggars. Okay? It says, light dawns in the darkness. We're not sure what light means. It could mean from God. God gives us his light. Jesus also said that we're supposed to be light of the world. But there's light wherever we go. There's compassion wherever we go. Where we go into the world and it's darkness, we show uprightness. We are gracious, merciful, and righteous. Why are we these things? Because God is these things. Uh, people who follow God are generous. They lend. They compare, con uh, conduct their affairs with justice. What this means is no bribes. You can't be, you don't play favorites. You do whatever is right. You do whatever is just, no matter what the cost is, because you're reflecting God, and God is always doing what is right, no matter what we think the cost is. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. Jesus said, build your house on the rock. It's the same sort of idea, that if you are believing in God if you are walking with God, you're not going to be moved. It says, his heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks upon the triumphs of his adversaries. In seven, he's not afraid of bad news. Our heart is a stabilizing, has a stabilized faith. And when we go through the world, we do not fear the world. We are not anxious about COVID. We're not anxious about riots. Because we know that if we hear some bad news, and the bad news can be a family tragedy, it can be financial, a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, as the stock market is going up and down, are being very afraid of what their retirement is going to be in the days ahead. We do not let bad news, we don't fear bad news. Bad news does not affect us because we know God's in charge of it all, that God's moving through things, that God is doing stuff, and that if the stock market skyrockets or plummets, it is in God's hand. God knows what he's doing. Nothing is, is escaping. Remember, everybody and everything is either being blessed or cursed by God. At any particular point in time, God is actively involved in the world, it says in 9, his horn is exalted in honor. Horn is an Old Testament way of saying your plans, your ideals, uh, what you want to be when you grow up, these sorts of things. The idea that uh, I, am, I, I, I see what God wants me to be. I see what God wants me to do. And as I do it, and I bring my personality into it, and I bring it so that I'm growing into it as a person, my horn is being honored. I am being seen by what's going on. And the idea that today you don't really want the fame that the world offers. Back then, there was the idea that if you were a godly person in Israel and you had a reputation that that would financially benefit you, you would be invited to things. Uh, today, there is not that society blessing of Christians. And so we say, well, my horn's going to be honored here. You're among friends. You're amongst other godly people. And we can look at each other and help one another and lift one another up and say, hey, you're doing pretty good. I see your reputation growing in the church, as it were, of following God. And then it ends, verse 10, with a, well, what about the other side? The wicked man sees it and is angry. And I think we see that a lot today, is that people are angry at Christians. And I wonder, you know, what are you angry about? I, I don't know. They don't know. But people seem to be angry, mad at Christians today. Uh, gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of wicked will perish. The gnashing of teeth is, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And you can take this and put it in the New Testament because Jesus said, the ungodly will spend eternity 
quailing and gnashing their teeth. I think there are going to be people who fight God today, and in the lake of fire, they'll still be fighting God. They'll still be mad, and they'll be angry for all eternity, while the godly are going to be happy, and we're going to be in the presence of God, and we're going to walk on the streets of gold, and we're going to drink from the river of life, and all the things that are promised because we put God first, because we take God seriously, and we live under the favor of God Almighty. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for this truth. I pray that you will keep our minds on eternity, that you will keep our minds in your word, that we will find things to do, find things to believe, and understand that the Christian life is a functional Christian life, is a growing Christian life, and we can grow into the presence of you by following your commands. Lord, we praise you for that and ask your blessing upon the remainder of the day, and we ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Thank you.